So, my name is Dylan Thompson. This is Jonah Mix. We're from Deep Green Resistance. And today we're going to be talking to you a little bit about shifting the environmental movement from a defensive movement to an offensive movement. Thank you all for coming. I want to start from the beginning to sort of frame our conversation today. For the past several thousand years, this beautiful planet has been the site of a dysfunctional relationship. And that's the relationship between civilization, or the way of life characterized by the emergence and growth of cities, and the more than human communities upon which that civilization is based. Now for the vast majority of our time here on this planet, the human element has fit into the logic of whatever land base we happen to be inhabiting. We watched, we listened, we felt and we kept open channels of communication with the land in order to maintain a beneficial, a mutually beneficial relationship. And that is what created the conditions for our long-term survival. There exist living examples of this older way of life, and I'm talking about the small-scale subsistence cultures that have lived in place for thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands, such as the Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert, um, the Kawahiva of the Brazilian Amazon, the Kogi who live in the Sierra Nevada mountains of Colombia, the Dombri Khan, who live in the Niamgiri Hills of India. To this day, the small-scale subsistence economy is the only time-tested mode of human sustainability on this planet. Period. It's also the way of life that's being destroyed the fastest because of civilization. Now, civilization, beginning just over 10,000 years ago in what's known as the Fertile Crescent, although it's not so fertile anymore, marks the beginning of a fundamentally different way of relating to the planet. This is when we see that human element start to impose its own logic over the logic of the land. Whereas before, human culture was an extension of the local ecosystem, it was an extension of the land. Now we see culture separate from nature and adopt a value system that's diametrically opposed to the principles and the workings of nature. Ever since that time, ever since the emergence of civilization, biotic life on Earth has suffered. And that's how we know that the relationship is dysfunctional. As the saying goes, you shall know a tree by its fruit. And by its fruit, industrial civilization, I would say civilization as a whole, stands condemned. Or at least it should. Every living system on the planet is in decline. And the rate of decline is accelerating. And there has not been a single peer-reviewed scientific article that's been published in the past 30 or so years that contradicts that statement. The fruit of civilization the fruit of our culture is drawdown of living systems. It's the drawdown of vitality of natural community. And it's that drawdown we want to look at. More specifically, what we're, what we're interested in are the values and the behaviors that have oriented this culture against the planet. And so that's what we're going to look at here. Um, so why should civilization stand condemned? First and foremost, it commits the cardinal sin which is that it does not benefit the land upon which it is based. All beings and communities must benefit the land where they live in order to survive for the long term. That's basic ecology. You have to give back as much or more than you take. Um, our culture is like a really, really bad house guest. It takes much more than its fair share, and what it gives back is toxic. <coughs> it gives back things that nobody can eat. Another point is that it values production over life. To civilization, the needs of the economic system outweigh the needs of the natural world, which is completely backwards and insane. The natural world can survive without an industrial economy, no problem. But no human economy can exist without a healthy natural world. It's embarrassing that I have to say that, but you look at the behavior of our culture, you listen to what the talking heads say on the radio and on TV, and you see that the economic system actually is what is valued the most. And about that economic system, our way of life requires widespread violence in order to exist. This culture would collapse very quickly without that violence. Violence against the earth, violence against non-human communities. But it should also be said that violence against members of our own species within civilization is astounding. Slavery is a good example of this. How many of you are aware that today there exist over 27 million <coughs> human slaves? 
at least. The current, human, the current industrial supply chain enslaves more people in the world than at any time in human history, and includes the pre-Civil War South. When you start to look at where the cotton in your shirt comes from, where the tantalum in your cell phone comes from, where the beans in your cup of coffee comes from, that's where you're going to find the slavery alive and well. Um, it's in the mines. It's in the fields. It's in the raw materials processing that we don't have to see because of our position in that supply chain. We're at the end. We're the capital C consumers. And I would encourage any of you who are interested in learning more about uh, the issue of modern slavery to look at the work of Kevin Bales. He came up with that 27 million number through his research, but says that that number actually is the most conservative estimate for how many slaves there are in the world today because that number accounts for those people who were forced into slavery at the point of a gun and who are kept there at the threat of direct violence to either themselves or their family. But that number doesn't take into consideration of the millions more wage slaves, sweatshop laborers, or those who are coerced into slave-like conditions through economic hardship, usually at the hands of predatory multinational corporations and their affiliates. This bottom one here is the big one for me, though. We actually live in a culture that has created stories that says, we can control and abuse the natural world. We have the right to do that. What we're dealing with in our culture is a huge issue of entitlement. Members of our culture feel that we are entitled to rip the tops off of mountains, to extract the bauxite, to turn into aluminum, to make into beer cans. Members of our culture think it's okay to take animals, torture them in vivisection labs in order to make shampoo. Members of our culture think that we can exempt ourselves from the natural cycles of life and death. And that we can have infinite growth on a finite planet. <coughs> The way this culture is behaving, it seems like it thinks it can destroy the planet and live on it too. We must understand that that violence is, that violence is a part of our culture. And it's been that way from the very beginning. It's a part of the fabric of civilization. It's part of the fabric of our economy. Why? Well, in part because it's economically rewarded. Violence feeds the bottom line of business and feeding the bottom line of business feeds paychecks. So I've been calling the relationship between civilization and the planet dysfunctional. But what we're here to say is that I don't think it's really accurate to call it dysfunctional if one side of the relationship commits daily acts of war against the other. This goes far beyond disrespect. I think the behavior of this culture constitutes a form of hatred. And it constitutes a form of hatred that's akin to a hatred of one's own flesh. Because those who suffer from the activities of our culture, that's our kin. That's our family. How can a culture continue year after year, decade after decade, century after century, to commit atrocity after atrocity after atrocity and not have at its core a deep hatred of the natural world? In the culture of make-believe, Derek Jensen writes, hatred felt long enough no longer feels like hatred. It feels like economics. It feels like religion. It feels like tradition. That's where we're at right now. Since this is a kind of a hatred of our larger earth body, our larger self, I think it's safe to say that our sense of self is no more sustainable than the physical structure of our economy. The stories that we're given, the cultural stories we're given, are not <coughs> telling us that our flesh is continuous with the flesh of the world. We don't get stories that tell us we are kin with the oak tree, with the jaguar, with the soil. Sure, you can glean from science that everything is connected on an atomic level, on a molecular level. But you look at what scientists do, and you look at what their research is used for, how it's pressed into service of extractive industry. Those stories are bunk when it comes to maintaining a beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship with the land. Mostly the stories we receive are stories of separation. We can go back to Rene Descartes, and I think, therefore I am, creating a divide between mind and matter. The stories we're given are the stories of human supremacy that tell us that we are 
superior to all other life forms and that we have the right to do the things we've been doing. We're animals. We are animals among animals. And those beings and communities that we are pushing out of existence into that longest night of extinction are not inferior beings. They are not resources. They are not there for our use and exploitation. Jonah and I are here today as animals, wanting to speak to the animal and all of you. We are speaking to those of you who identify first and foremost with the real physical world. And we're speaking to those of you who understand that this is war. We're in a war. And we've been in a war for the past 12,000 years. Civilization has been in a war with the Earth for that long. And it's time we start behaving like it. So we're speaking to those of you who want to fight back strategically. And we're speaking to those of you who want to win. Thanks for bearing with me on that. Now we can get started on what we're going to do. Um, there's a movement. It was a movement that was created to deal with the dysfunctional relationship. And most of us know that as the environmental movement. Um, you can trace it back to different starting points. Most people like to say that the modern contemporary environmental movement has its origins in the Romantics of the 18th century. Fast forward to the 19th century, you have the conservationist movement. 20th century, you have the land ethic from Albert Leopold, Sand County Almanac. And then in 1962, Rachel Carson, Rachel Carson published her book, Silent Spring, which really brought the environmental movement to a public visibility that hadn't been seen yet. One would think having an environmental <coughs> movement around for this long, even just from 1962, we've had more than 50 years of a modern environmental movement. And yet, every living system on the planet is in decline. And the decline's accelerated. Why? That's our question today, is why? There's been a prolifer proliferation of other groups, large and small, that have done some good work here and there, but by and large, the environmental movement has remained a defensive movement. Our losses are permanent and offensive, and oftentimes our victories are just defensive and temporary. Save this patch of forest for a few, few years, maybe a decade, it eventually gets cut down. Save this river, save this watershed, it's eventually poisoned. <coughs> this is Rosa Durando. <coughs> Lives in Florida. She's a member of the Palm Beach Audubon Society, the County Land Use Advisory Board, the Citizens Task Force on Zoning, the Countywide Council on Beaches and Shores. She's been a full-time environmentalist watchdog for the past 10 years. And she said, sometimes I feel like a total failure. Other times I tell myself I've done well by getting concessions. I don't think any environmentalists are really successful. The other side is too powerful and too rich. The best we can hope for are safeguards to avoid total destruction next year. Now Rosa is one of the few honest among us, I think, willing to, to speak honestly about if you're going to do land defense work, how much of an uphill battle you're actually up against. But the one point I would disagree with Rosa on is that the best we can hope for are safeguards to avoid total destruction next year. We think there's another path forward to actually stop the destruction. And so for some other possibilities, I'll hand it over to John. So when we're talking about strategies in a war, you have defense and you have offense. Defense is uh, anything you do. Oops, I'm holding it upside down. A defensive action is anything you do that prevents the opposing force from gaining territory, gaining power, or gaining resources. Uh, you know, maybe a developer wants to clear cut 100 yards or 100 acres of old growth forest. You take them to court and you save 50 acres. That's a defensive action and it's valuable and it's good and we need it. We need everyone working as hard as we can to do things like that. But the fact is, the developer still gets 50 acres. You may have saved some, but at the very best possible outcome of a defensive action is that things stay the same. You can't win a war through defense alone. And that's where offensive action comes in. And offensive action removes territory, it removes resources, and it removes power from the opposing force. It directly takes from the side you're going up against. 
The fact is that today, 99% of what the system of industrial civilization does is offensive. It dams rivers, it strip mines mountains, it rounds up African Americans and it throws them in jail, it rapes women, it commits genocide, everything the system does. It's acting to gain power, it's acting to gain territory, and it's acting to gain resources. And really, for, except for a few specific times, the system doesn't really do a lot of defen uh, defensive work because there's no one coming up against it. It doesn't have to. And in the same way, the environmental movement is too busy fighting defensive battles to focus on offensive gains. Right now, the environmental movement largely can't even really conceive of what an offensive campaign against ecocide would be. And I think everyone understands this isn't a recipe for victory. And we've been seeing it for a long time. Major Stoneman Douglas, one of my heroes, said, when a developer wins a battle, it's in concrete. But when environmentalists win a battle, it's only for 30 days. And really what she's capturing there is the heart of the matter. The, environmental, or the developers are fighting offensive battles. They're gaining territory and they're holding it. And environmentalists are fighting defensive battles. At the very best, we're delaying their forward march. And I want to make it very clear, we're not doing this because we're stupid. We're not doing it because we're lazy. We're not doing it because we're not willing to risk what it takes. We're doing it because we're up against a massive system that has guns, it has bombs, it has jails, it has the nightly news, it has TV and talk radio, it has our schools, and it has everything it needs to make sure that at the very best, we can just slow it down a little. And most of us don't have anything but a few bucks, some picket signs, our bodies, and a love for the living planet. But there are strategies that not only address that inequality, but they leverage it to make sure that the environmental movement can adopt an approach that was offensive and did have chances to make real gains against the system that's killing the planet. One of my favorite quotes in the world is from Malcolm X, where he says, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and you pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. And of course, Malcolm X there was speaking about the wound that white America and white people had inflicted on Africans. But of course, it's the same when it comes to the earth. Slowing it down a little bit isn't progress. Even stopping it isn't progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. As, our, as Dylan said, our enemy is industrial civilization. It's not capitalism. It's not corporations. It's not even fossil fuels. To be clear, all of those things have to be done away with, and they have to be done away with fast. But they're all just expressions of a deeper problem. To end the destruction of the living world, we have to end industrial civilization itself. And industrial civilization, like every system, has two components. It has the structure, and it has the values. When you talk about structure, you're talking about the real world, material things that make up the system. And when you talk about values, you're talking about the ideology that was invented to defend that system. For industrial civilization, the system, or the structure is pretty clear. At the very top, you've got the energy grid. Uh, you've got extraction infrastructure, you've got communications infrastructure, you've got financial systems, and you've got the technology industry. All of these things are working towards one of three goals. Gaining access to resources, extracting those resources, or processing those resources to make them usable for industrial civilization. Um, anything from clear cuts to strip mines to the things we normally don't think of in these terms like police violence or genocide or rape, uh, these are all about resources, about gaining access to them, about extracting them, and about making them usable for industrial civilization. And our resistance can't be about anything but stopping one of those three things. Everything we do has to be about stopping the control of resources, stopping the extraction of resources, and stopping the processing of resources to be used for industrial civilization. At the center of the process is the energy grid. Without the energy grid, you've got nothing. You can't spin the drills that kill mountains. You can't run the computers that decide where the, ki the murdered mountains go. You can't keep the lights on in the buildings that take the murdered mountains and turn them into cell phone batteries for us. Without power, 
Without an energy grid, industrial civilization has nothing. And after that, you got extraction infrastructure. This is the part that teases the resources. And remember that when we say resources, we mean the living planet. We mean the world. We mean bodies. We mean bones. We mean blood. We mean living, breathing creatures. It seizes them, and it grinds them up. Mining, logging, fracking, refining, wind, and solar, all of these are a part of the extraction infrastructure. And that infrastructure is largely, largely organized by the communications infrastructure. That's phone lines and cell towers, and increasingly more the internet, that helps keep the different parts of the system working together. And of course, extraction and communications are based on the financial system that keeps capital flowing to help multinational corporations invest in these extraction processes. And that extraction is supported by and made more efficient by the technology industry. So all together, these systems work. Everyone depends on everyone else. The energy grid needs the technology industry and it needs communications. Extraction needs the energy grid and financial systems. They all need each other. They all depend on each other. And they can all be dealt with in ways that hurt each one at the same time. But we'll get to that later. Looking at this though, it's important to remember that that's only one aspect of the system we're talking about. There's also uh, the values of the system. The, the, the ideology, the stories we tell ourselves that have uh, allowed this system to continue. And if you want to talk about it, there's only really one value of industrial civilization, and that's expansion. That's growth. There's nothing the system cares about other than growth. And if you want endless expansion, you're going to need three things. You're going to need hierarchy, you're going to need stability, and you're going to need efficiency. Hierarchy is the ranking of individual human beings, of individual lives, of individual communities. Industrial civilization absolutely needs hierarchy because a free and egalitarian social system makes endless expansion impossible. White supremacy, patriarchy, and human supremacy are all central to industrial civilization because without them, the exploitation of the, the more than human world of Africans, indigenous people, Latinas and Latinos, and everyone else around the world who isn't lily white, and of course women, could not be justified if we didn't have the mythology that we do that supports these systems of supremacy. Next, of course, you have supremacy, or excuse me, you have stability. Because without stability, uh, you don't have a steady system, and without a steady system, a steady baseline, you can't expand. So the system, to gain stability, it encourages comfort and it encourages ignorance. You know, you give people refrigerated food, you give them 500 channels on their television, you give them these things, and suddenly we don't see the destruction around us, or we don't care. And now it should be pointed out that that doesn't mean that everybody inside industrial civilization is comfortable or ignorant. Largely, the people who are comfortable and ignorant are the ones at the top. The ones at the bottom, whether it's the non-human world, or whether it's uh, people of color, whether it's women, are largely very aware of what the system is doing, and there's nothing comfortable about their conditions. But the system is always working to make sure that any avenues for education and any avenues for confrontation with the reality of the system are studied any way they can. And finally, you have efficiency, because of course more efficiency means more expansion. And uh, that's where you get consumerism, because the more people buy, the more the markets keep going, the more you can produce, and the more production equals more growth. You also have the progress myth, which is this idea, this foolish story we tell ourselves, that human beings were created or born or otherwise arose in a state of primitivism and poverty and stupidity and weakness, and that we're moving towards some grander design. And of course, we achieve that grander design, it just so happens, through destroying the world around us. Now the fact is that human beings aren't moving towards any grander design any more than pigs or centipedes or whales are moving to a grander design. And no one talks about the day in which pigs or centipedes will seize control of the planet and make it better for pigs or centipedes. But we like to believe it because if you don't believe that, you can't justify the destruction. And of course, that's where our love of science comes in. Because of course, when you love science, you need it because it's hard to make drills, it's hard to make superconductors. It's hard to make defoliants, it's hard to make these things that kill the planet if you don't have science. So, here's what I want to highlight, if there's anything else we can talk about today. 
It's that effective resistance to a system requires that you reject the values and you attack the structure. It can never take place on the system's terms, and it can never leave the structure of the system in place. You have to attack the values, or excuse me, reject the values and attack the structure. If there's one single flaw that's holding the modern environmental movement back, it's our inability to stand firm against more than one aspect of the system at a time. So as an example of this, I used to live in Bellingham, Washington a few years back, which if anyone knows is a big site for uh, controversy over coal trains. They're murdering mountains all across the country, packing them up into trains, driving them up here to the ports in Bellingham, up to Vancouver and across China to keep the lights on in factories where children sew our shoes. And so people fought back, and they fought back, and they were brave, and they were intelligent, and they were smart. So I want to talk about what would it mean if you're talking about coal trains to do this? Well, let's start. Let's say you defend the structure and retain the values. That would be, let's say you call up the company that owns the port that's shipping out your coal, and you say, hey, I only want union labor pulling the coal out of these things. They might, you know, they probably won't listen to you, but let's say you get it. Let's say you get union labor to unload the coal. There's nothing wrong with that. Unions are great. But you haven't attacked the structure because the coal is still flowing. And more importantly, you haven't rejected the values because you still adopted as a given that human beings have the right to ship coal at all. Now, let's say you want to attack the structure. So you call up your congressperson and you, or your representative and you demand that they replace coal trains with wind farms and solar panels. Now, again, they probably won't listen to you, but you could put enough pressure. You could get petitions going. You could hire lobbyists. And you could probably slow down coal exporting. And that's great. You've made a hit against the structure. There's nothing wrong about that. But you've done it on the assumption that coal trains or wind farms or solar panels or electricity at all are justified. And the system can pat you on the back. You know, it can go out and it can say, okay, we're not going to do as many coal trains. And then it can strip mine a mountain, it can dam a river, it can kill just as many living creatures, and it can call it renewable, and then it'll sell it back to you. The, the, the system took a little hit, but the values were untouched, so the system recovered very quickly. And on the opposite side, you could sell your car, you could move into a smaller house, you could grow your own food, you could sew your own clothes, so on. You could condemn the entire system of industrial civilization. You could drop out and you could be very vocal about it. That's great, again. But even if you've rejected the values, the coal trains keep rolling. The structure is safe, and the system doesn't care you know, couldn't care less what values you hold. But what would it mean to strike at coal trains in a way that announces to the world a rejection of coal trains, or wind farms, or solar panels, or electricity itself, as a concept? What would it mean to strike at the system in a way that not only does damage to the structure, but also to the ideology that justifies it? You could, well, if you wanted to do that, you could take a blowtorch, you could take a crowbar, some dynamite, and you could destroy the rail line then suddenly those, trail, those coal trains aren't going anywhere. But more importantly, there's no way for the system to recover on its own terms. Because remember, this system values expansion. It values comfort. It values hierarchy. And it values efficiency. And if you're condemning coal trains because they're wasteful and solar is much more efficient, or because coal trains are noisy and solar is quiet, or because coal trains clog up transportation and sol uh, solar power allows you to drive easier, well that's great because the system wants efficiency. It doesn't want things to be noisy. It wants things to be comfortable. And so it'll be happy to replace the coal trains with something more efficient, quieter, less disruptive, and still every bit as destructive to the earth as before. But if you strike against coal trains because the very idea of a living planet is incompatible with electricity or coal trains or wind farms or anything else, You've given the system an ultimatum that it can't easily escape. Now, of course, this is all hypothetical. I'm not telling you to go out and blow up or otherwise damage anything. The point isn't the su that successful resistance requires bombs. It's that it requires taking a hard stance against the system in its entirety. The values of industrial civilization and the values of a healthy culture that is capable of living in communion with the world are incompatible. And we, by pushing that contradiction, not capitulating to the system's values, we can strengthen our cause. So if you want to 
There you go. So if you want to do this, if you want to take a decisive strike against the industrial system, you're going to need two things. You're going to need a target, and you're going to need a strategy. When it comes to Carver, uh, excuse me, when it comes to target selection, the gold standard in a lot of organizations is something called the Carver Matrix. Uh, the United States military has used the Carver Matrix uh, to identify targets in every war since Vietnam. Police agencies use Carver to target organized crime. Even CEOs use it when they're trying to buy another company. And considering that the American military, the police, and CEOs are currently kicking our asses when it comes to this struggle, it might be worthwhile to look at what's made them so effective. Now the goal of a Carver matrix is to allow someone to identify what targets should be take, action should be taken against. Carver is an acronym. It stands for criticality, accessibility, recuperability, vulnerability, effect, and recognizability. It's also on the back of your uh, sheet. Uh, I see it. Sorry. It's on the back of the, of the other thing. Um, criticality means how important is the target. Accessibility, how easy is it to get to the target. Recuperability, how long will it take the system to replace or repair the target. Vulnerability, how easy is it to damage the target. Effect, how will losing the target hurt the system. And recognizability, how easy is the target to identify. Now, you'll notice if you think about it that some of these things tend to group together and others don't get along. Uh, plenty of targets might be recognizable, they might be vulnerable, and they might be easily accessible. But those usually aren't very critical, and they, aren't, and they can usually be repaired pretty easily. We're talking about Starbucks windows, a police station, something like that. Uh, and some targets are incredibly critical and almost impossible to repair with massive effect, but they're hard to identify access and damage. That would be oil refineries, hydroelectric dams, things like that. The purpose of Carver, though, is to help you identify what is the target that hits the most of these categories the highest. You're never going to find a target that's critical, accessible, not recuperable, vulnerable, highly effective, and recognizable. But with Carver, you can at least figure out which target is most likely to succeed. Uh, to use a matrix, it's really simple. You just sit down with a list of targets. You pick three, pick four, pick five. And you assign each a score from one to ten in every category. And then you add them up where you average them. There are arguments on internet forums about which ones you should do, but you can do either one. And, if you, and then you find out which score's highest. If you want a little homework assignment, you could do it. You could targets and you could choose yourself. You know, say, this dam, that, that rail line, this power station. You know, list them up and, and try it yourself. It's not hard. Oops. Holding this thing upside down again. There we go. So, if you flip your papers over again. Let's say you decided on a target using Harvard. And now you need to know what to do. So we've handed out this chart that we in DGR call the taxonomy of action and we encourage you to take a look, it's also up here. Uh, the taxonomy of action is a collection of a bunch of different strategies and approach that activists can use in the fight against any system, but especially the fight against industrial civilization. We divide it into two categories. We have acts of omission, which is not doing something, and acts of co you know, commission, which is doing something. You know, acts of omission uh, are on the left, and they usually are somewhat low risk, but they require a lot of people. That would be strikes, uh, boycotts, protests. And on the right, you've got you know, uh, decreasing numbers of people required, but there's higher risk. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is this little corner here. And we want to be clear, and I can't say this over and over more, is that when we talk about the need for offensive action, when we talk about the need for underground action, we're not saying that anything to the left of this little corner is worthless. We need it all. We need boycotts. We need strikes. We need protests. We need workers' cooperatives. We need permaculture groups. We need songs and plays. We need it all. The problem isn't that our movement is inherently ineffective. It's just incomplete. We're focusing on this little corner today because there are a lot of other organizations that would happily focus on the rest, and we support them, and they're valuable. But we identify a lack of discussion of this little corner of the book, of the chart, and so that's what we'd like to talk today about today. But that doesn't mean that we think the rest of these tactics aren't valuable, or that the people who are doing them are in some way you know, betraying the movement, or they're lazy, or anything like that. Absolutely not. But when we are talking about this corner, the offensive actions, we're talking about four major categories. We have uh, uh, obstruction and occupation. We have reclamation and expropriation. We have property and material destruction, and we have violence against humans. Obstruction and occupation would be seizing a node of infrastructure and holding it, 
preventing this, uh, the system from utilizing that to extract resources or process them. Um, uh, reclamation and expropriation would be seizing resources from the, from the system and putting them to our use. And then um, uh, property material destruction is exactly what it sounds, and that's damaging the system in a way that it can't be used. And then, of course, as a last result, we also have violence against humans, both defensive and offensive. These four tactics uh, work for, with each other. For example, a hypothetical underground could seize a mining outpost and reclaim explosives that are later used for material destruction. Or a group of above-ground activists could occupy an oil pipeline checkpoint while underground actors take the, chan uh, you know, take the opportunity to strike at the pipeline down the road. You know, again, this is all strictly hypothetical. The point is that just like our movement needs both offense and defense, it also needs different kinds of offense done together and smartly in pursuit of a larger goal. Now this is a lot of information and it's a little abstract and when security culture comes into play, and we'll talk about that in a bit, it can be even more difficult to talk about these things as concretely as we'd like. So often we found the best method is to look historically and see what struggles have succeeded through the use of these ta uh, tactics and uh, how do they do it. So um, we're going to ask Dylan to talk a little bit about some historical struggles that have used these tactics and come out victorious. Thanks, Joan. So yeah, I'm just going to go over three different historical movements. Some of them have happened in the past, one of them is happening right now. Um, and these are all movements that have utilized more of a complete uh, repertoire, let's just say, of, of this chart here. More tactics. Um, how many of you have heard of the African National Congress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the first example. <coughs> the goal of the ANC was equal rights for all South Africans, regardless of ethnicity. And how they were going to get there was that they were going to put pressure on the South African apartheid government to implement constitutional reform and return of the freedoms denied under the apartheid regime. So from 1912 to 1960, the ANC existed as an above-ground organization. They were doing strikes, boycotts, protests, demonstrations, education, and awareness raising. And they were also doing some alternative political education. And like I said, this was all above ground uh, because the ANC figured that um, they could achieve their goals by making their activities visible to the public and to the government. But in 1960, things came to a head when um, the government passed what was called the Pass Laws, and it required blacks to carry identification cards with them. And they had protested this before, but they passed a new and more stringent set of these pass laws. And it came to a head when, in a town called Sharpville, um, police ended up killing 69 people in a protest and injuring 180. And after that time, the ANC was driven underground because they were deemed illegal in the country. Um, so the political activity was banned, and they moved out of the country or underground within South Africa. And that's when the military wing of the ANC was formed in 1961. It was called the Kumkanto Wesizwe, the Spear of the Nation. And so their goal, the Kumkanto Wesizwe's goal, was the same. Equal rights for all South Africans regardless of ethnicity. But their strategy was a little bit different. Things were a little bit more desperate. The above ground strategies that they thought would work, that the ANC thought would work, hadn't worked. So they were going to use guerrilla warfare to bring the South African government to the bargaining table. And their strategy evolved through a number of phases. In the early 1960s, they were involved mostly in sabotage. And um, let me just say that in their early stages, the ANC, being underground, did most of the organization and the strategy for the Umkanto Way. Later on, the Umkanto Way breaks off and developed its own command structure. But in the early 1960s, um, they were sabotaging um, government installations, police stations, electric pylons, pass offices, and other symbols of apartheid rule. Um, in phase two, mid-1960s and mid-1970s, this was the phase of political mobilization and developing underground structures. Something called the Revolutionary Council was established in 1969 to train military cadres as part of a long-term plan to build a robust underground network. And the most of the training was happening in foreign foreign camps in neighboring countries. In phase three, which took place from the mid-1970s to 1983, 
This was when the large-scale guerrilla warfare and armed attacking was happening. There were noticeable increase in armed attacks in South Africa. They were sabotaging railway lines, administration offices, police stations, oil refineries, fuel depots, the Coburg nuclear plant, military targets, and military personnel. And by the time phase four rolled around, 1983 to 1990, Nkantawe Sizwe wanted to take the war into the white areas and make it a people's war. So the Revolutionary Council was replaced by something called the Political Military Council, which controlled and integrated the activities of the now numerous sections of Yumkantawe Seasway. And there were continuing attacks on economic, strategic, and military installations in white suburbs. So this is a good example. The ANC is a good example of that rejecting of values and attacking the structure that Jonah was talking about. And they were successful at ending apartheid. The combination of ANC's work to promote mass political struggle with the Yumkantawe Seasway's armed struggle, succeeded in pressuring the apartheid government to unban the ANC in 1990. South Africa had their first multiracial elections based on one person, one vote, held in April 1994. And Nelson Mandela became uh, South Africa's first black chief executive. So I think a lot of you know who Nelson Mandela is. I, know, I knew who Nelson Mandela was before I knew about the ANC, Yumkantawe Seasway. I knew he was somehow involved in ending apartheid. I didn't know that he was that he had the role that he did. He had an integral role in creating the Umkhonto Oasis. He organized himself sabotage. He organized himself assassinations. Um, and I don't know if a lot of us actually know what he did. He's, he's counted as a hero by many people, but I don't actually know if they know exactly what he did. And about that, <coughs> Nelson Mandela himself said, I do not deny that I planned sabotage. I did not plan it in a spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love of violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation, and oppression of my people by the whites. Okay, moving on to the next group. I want to talk about the Irish Republican Army. Their goal was the end of English rule to form a free, independent republic. Britain had been colonizing and oppressing the Irish people for 500 years. 500 years. And the Irish had been fighting in, in multiple ways for all that time. Um, and this is, this is the development of a new strategy. And the strategy was guerrilla warfare, to make governing Ireland impossible. And the cost of staying in the country so great um, that the British would be forced to withdraw. So what did they do? Well, um, the Irish Republican Army was kind of the underground wing of the above-ground Sinn Féin Irish Republican Party. The Sinn Féin Party formed their own breakaway government and declared independence from Britain. And as with the ANC in South Africa, a new strategy was necessary when the government declared Sinn Féin illegal in 1919. And that spawned the IRA. And of course they were repressed heavily. And that created broad support for the IRA within Ireland. So how the IRA worked, um, have any of you seen the, the movie um, The Wind That Shakes the Barley? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's about the old IRA. They operated in what they call flying columns of 15 to 30 people. They trained in guerrilla warfare, often up in the hills with their, um, with their uh, game sticks. They didn't have real rifles a lot of the time for their training, so they would use sticks to train in the hills. And their tactics included hit and run raids, ambushes, assassination. They ended up blowing up police and military bases, destroying Coast Guard stations. They burned courthouses and tax collectors offices. And they, and they killed police and military personnel. Why did they adopt these tactics? Because they understood that a truly free an independent Irish Republic was only achievable through a confrontation with the British. Their methods of confrontation were chosen based on the resources and training they had available. It was definitely an asymmetric conflict. The Irish were the underdog going up against the British military. But that broad base of support that had been created through British repression created a broad network of safe houses and people who supported them in Ireland. So they had food, supplies, safe houses, medical support when they needed it. And military historians have concluded that the IRA waged pretty much 
a highly successful campaign against the British because the British military determined that the IRA could not be defeated militarily. Um, and the struggle continues. So the last movement I want to talk about is the contemporary one, and that is the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. A little backstory, with the help of various dictatorships over the course of Nigeria's history, since it declared independence from, from British colonial rule, multinational oil companies such as Chevron and uh, Royal Dutch Shell have been appropriating oil from the Niger Delta. For people living in the Delta, this has meant total destruction of their way of life. Most of the people are fishing people, and the rivers are full of oil. People have been dispossessed in favor of foreign interests, and the local people rarely see any revenue from these extractive projects. So the pattern is the same here. Over the past 20 years, there has been a, a large nonviolent civil disobedience movement in the Niger Delta, um, led mostly by the Ogoni people. Have any of you heard of Ken Saro Wiwa? Yeah. He was a, a poet, and he was a poet turned activist. And he did a lot of protesting the government and the, the collusion between the government and the, the oil companies. Um, and he was executed. He was, he was executed along with, uh, I think it was 12 others, um, in 1995 on what many to believe deliberately false charges with the aim of silencing his vocal opposition to the oil interests in Nigeria. So in his footsteps came others who saw the government's reaction to nonviolent activism and then advocated using force to resist what they saw as the enslavement of their people. So the goal of men was majority or total control of oil production and revenues in the Niger Delta for the Ogoni people, and withdrawal of the Nigerian military from the Niger Delta. And they were going to do that by totally destroying the capacity of the Nigerian government to export oil. And they were going to force the multinational oil companies to discontinue operations and likely precipitate a nationwide budgetary and economic crisis. Their tactics, sabotage. MEND has been sabotaging oil infrastructure with very, very few people and very, very few resources. It's been amazing. Um, they've resorted to bombings, theft, guerrilla warfare. They've kidnapped foreign oil workers for ransom. They're organized in underground cells with a few spokespeople who communicate with international media. Leaders are always on the move and extremely cautious. They do not take telephone calls personally knowing that soldiers hunting for them have electronic devices capable of pinpointing mobile phone signals. During raids, fighters wear masks to protect their identity. They use aliases. Their recruitment is clandestine. Whether they designed it or not, their organizational structure has proven very effective, despite their small numbers, um, despite the sort of hodgepodge networking that goes on. They've been pretty effective. How effective? Um, between the years of 2006 and 2009, they, they made a cut of more than 28% of Nigerian oil output. In total, they have reduced oil output in the Niger Delta by 40%. It's a ridiculous number when you consider how, how few resources these people have. So that's really it. Um, those are just a few examples of, of movements that have used sort of a broad spectrum of actions on the taxonomy of action chart that we handed out. This is mostly just to say that the precedent for resistance, for full spectrum resistance, has been set many, many times. There are many, many, many more groups than this who have utilized force because they understand that those in power understand the language of force the best. And they do, they try nonviolence, they try asking nicely, they try making concessions, and it, and it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, this is what works. So I'm going to give it over to Jonah to finish this off. This is our, our favorite quote from men, by the way. Uh, they released in a communique. It must be clear to the Nigerian government, or it must be clear that the Nigerian government cannot protect your workers or assets. Leave our land while you can or die in it. That's the message they sent to Shell Oil Company. Now, you just heard a lot from Dylan about people building bombs, picking up guns, committing sabotage. And we're adamant that those types of resistance are necessary for an effective environmental movement to succeed, like the IRA or the ANC, where men succeeded. But that doesn't mean that the only role in a militant struggle is either blowing something up or staying at home and keeping quiet. 
Uh, Leah Keith is one of my greatest inspirations, and she said it right. For those of us who can't be active on the front lines, and this will be most of us, our job is to create a culture that will encourage and promote political resistance. The main tasks will be loyalty and material support. Remember that during the uh, armed struggle against the British, only about 2% of those involved with the Irish Republican Army ever took up arms. And for every men soldier, there were hundreds or even thousands of Nigerians who helped them in any way they could. We do this presentation in the hopes that somewhere here in the audience is a warrior who's ready to do what needs to be done, but we also do it to reach those who aren't able to commit to underground action and let them know what they can do to bring about a culture of resistance. The first, <coughs> excuse me, the first role of an above-ground activist is underground promotion, which is what we're trying to do right now. Underground promotion is anything that works to create the conditions for an underground to develop and work effectively. There are, broadly speaking, <coughs> two camps that underground promotion falls into. The first will be passive promotion, which means promoting out after the fact or in a roundabout way. For some people, this is all they can safely do. You might try and talk about the failures of the modern environmental movement, even if you don't suggest a solution that lies in militancy, frankly discussing the reality of our situation is a great way to inspire people to look further. You can work to shift the culture slowly towards resistance values, and if sabotage does occur, you can support it. Or if that's not safe for you, you can at least take those opportunities to criticize the system and not those who struck against it. If you are in a position to be more vocal, you can explicitly critique traditional environmentalist ideology. This includes critiquing pacifism or our defense-focused movement, arguing in public and amongst comrades for the necessity of revolutionary violence or strategic militancy, and promoting and encouraging those acts whenever possible. And that means especially after acts of sabotage or militancy do occur. And as our final note, if you're an above-ground activist who is taking on the project of underground promotion, or if you do happen to be hypothetically an underground activist, you need to have good security culture. Security culture is a set of customs in a community that people adopt to make sure that anyone who performs illegal or sensitive action has their risks minimized and their safety uh, supported. You're practicing security culture when you consider what you say or do in light of its potential effects on the people around you. There are tons of resources on security culture. We have a presentation on security culture. If you want to look it up online, there are a lot of other great ones. But if you want the basics, it can be broken down into simple do's and don'ts. The do, the number one, would be keep all sensitive information on a strict need-to-know basis. Whether it's names, plans, past action, even just loose ideas, uh, unless there's a tangible material benefit to sharing that information and it can be done safely, you need to keep it quiet. More radical movements have been undone by people bragging to their friends to try and look tough or getting drunk and letting a name slip than by all of our bullets, bombs, and prisons combined. A good way to make sure uh, you follow this rule is to assume that you're always being monitored. Uh, I wrote this presentation with Dylan, assuming that there may be ag FBI agents or police in the audience listening now. If you're here, how's it going? Uh, now, I don't know if they are or not. I very well may not be. But we made the decision to take it as a given because we shouldn't be saying anything in public that they wouldn't want, that they wouldn't, you know, that they shouldn't hear. You know, and that doesn't mean we should be paranoid, always looking over our shoulder, wondering if this guy's an agent, that guy's a plant, that guy's an infiltrator. Because if we're following security culture well, it shouldn't matter. That's the thing about security culture. When you practice it well, it doesn't make you paranoid. It frees you from paranoia. <coughs> And then finally, um, a lot of security culture really boils down to just respecting people's boundaries and learning to establish them yourself. And this is why feminism is essential to the radical struggle, because patriarchy celebrates boundary breaking. Uh, mascul masculinity demands that men don't respect no's, that they blow past anyone who says, I don't want to do that, I don't want to talk about that, or just says no. And a true security culture that we, means that we develop the skill to say no and the skills to just say nothing at all if we don't feel safe, if we don't secure, feel secure, or if we don't think it's going to be valuable. There's a great article out there that I'd really encourage you to Google search. It's called Misogynists Make Great Informants. And it's about the role that masculine culture and macho posturing can play in wrecking our movements. So uh, boundary setting is the end all and be all of security culture. And the best tool in the world for developing boundary setting in a community is adopting a strict and you know central role for feminism in your movement.
And when it comes to don'ts, it's even more simple. Don't ask questions that could endanger people involved in direct action. You know, don't, um, you know, it's the flip side of the need to know, is that if you don't need to know it, don't ask it. And if you do need to know it, maybe don't even ask it then. Maybe wonder, you know, wait for someone to bring it to you, and then if they bring it to you in a way that's not safe, you also need to say no. Finally, um, you also need to make sure that your underground promotion doesn't cross the line into incitement. If you tell a, a crowd of people, go, up and, go out and blow up this dam or that bridge, you're not promoting anymore, you're inciting. And that can have serious legal consequences for you or other people in the movement. Um, you should talk to a lawyer or another experienced activist if you want to know uh, where that line is, considering it does change in different states, depends on what you're saying. And then of course, finally, don't speak to the police, don't speak to the FBI. They're not your friends, they can lie to you. They might come to you and say, oh, we know that someone's doing this, you know, you need to tell us this. Don't trust them. You're never going to lose anything for, by asking for a lawyer, and you're never going to gain anything by talking to the cops. Uh, we also encourage people to avoid drugs, alcohol, or other non-political illegal activities that might compromise your ability to follow these rules. You know, our movement has been hurt by good activists who fall into addiction or become compromised in other uh, areas. But if you do follow these rules, if you don't talk to cops, if you keep information on a need-to-know basis, if you keep an eye out for legal troubles, you, we can keep the resistance movement healthy and safe and strong. No. That concludes our presentation. You know, we've covered a lot of ground, and we've talked about a lot of different stuff. And I want to thank you for sticking with us and giving us the time to present our perspective. You know, if you've got more questions, you can always come up and speak with us, or check out deepgreenresistance.org, it's online. You know, uh, we've given presentations on this subject before, and it's left people inspired, hopefully, but it's also left people confused. It's left people conflicted, it's left people upset. And I want to end by saying that that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. If you can listen to someone talk about violence, whether it's strategic or not, and it doesn't weigh on your heart, then you have no place in a resistance movement. None of us have come to our positions lightly. Like most in the environmental movement, we started out as liberals. We bought the right soap. We went to the right marches, and some of us even put our bodies on the line in protest and direct action. But each one of us, for whatever reason, has come to the conclusion that what we're doing now just isn't enough, and that we love the planet too much to not consider every option. We respectfully ask that you sit with whatever feelings you might have, whether it's moral uncertainty or anger or whatever, and if you come away and you don't feel in your heart that the next step needs to be taken, you know, we aren't judging you, we aren't condemning you, we need you, and the struggle needs you, and to do one of the million other jobs that a nonviolent, peaceful activist can do for this movement. But we'd ask that before you decide, you do one thing. You go down to the river. <coughs> you go down to a riverbank. You watch the salmon spawn, you watch bison roam, you look up at the sky, and you hear songbirds and crickets, and you ask yourself, if these people could talk, what would they ask of me? What would the pine tree cry out for over the hum of the chainsaw blades? The starfish mother, who's watching her babies cook to death in an acid ocean, if she could speak, what would she ask you to do? These people matter. Their lives matter every bit as much as our lives matter to you and me. And they need us. They need us to be smart. They need us to be strong. They need us to be strategic, and they need us to be effective. We believe that what we've presented here and what we've detailed more fully in our book is a real shot at stopping the greatest mass, mass death in 6,000 centuries. You know, we welcome everyone, whether they're supporters, whether they're promoters, or whether they are warriors, to move past 60 years of frustration and 60 years of not quite enough and towards a strategic <coughs> environmental movement that's going to do what it takes. You know, this isn't in my presentation, but a couple days ago before I left from here, I was walking across my driveway and a little frog jumped out. And you don't see frogs a lot where I live anymore. And I have friends who have lived in that area for 10, 20 years, and they say there were times where you couldn't talk to someone outside after 7 p.m. because the frogs were too loud. And I haven't even heard the frogs yet this year. And I saw the little frog come out, and I, and I remember reading that frog tadpoles in some areas in this country are reaching a 99% death rate because they're ch they don't form correctly because of the heat. And when they're born, when that frog, that frog coming along, I, I believe was a female, 
looking out. That frog looks at its children. There's a day where that frog comes to the lake, the pond behind my house, and it sees its eggs and it thinks my children are here. And they're not. Those children come out and they die. They choke for a little bit, and then they suffocate and then they die. And I hear people after presentations like this, they come to me and they say, well, I don't, I just can't, I can't handle violence. I can't stand violence. And I say, I can't stand violence either. I can't stand violence against that frog's children. I can't stand violence against indigenous people. I can't stand violence against bison and wolves. I can't stand violence against centipedes and snails. I can't stand violence against women. I can't stand violence against the people whose lives are fodder for this system. So I would say, we don't like violence any more than you do. But that frog doesn't like violence either. And she doesn't have a choice. If you're a human being, if you're an American, if you're a white man like me, the question isn't violence or nonviolence. That question was decided a long time ago for me. My life is based on violence. Our lives as human beings and civilizations is based on violence. The question is whether or not we're going to use that violence to keep killing the world or if we're going to use that violence to help bring something new. And so I just encourage you to remember that there's, there's violence out there already and it's happening to people who can't tell us what's going on. It's happening to people who screams we don't hear because we're not listening. And so I would tell you, if you listen to this and you say, I just can't handle the violence, I would say, welcome aboard, because we can't handle it either. Thank you. Woo!